All right, and let's uh, let's get started. So, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, very excited today for this. Uh, going to be a really interesting talk, I'm sure. Um, Nick Vincent is our speaker today. Nick is a PhD candidate from the Northwestern University um, studying technology and social behavior, which is, uh, my understanding, is a joint program between computer science and communications. Uh, Nick does super cool work, um, obviously of interest to some people that I, I see joining the, joining the call today. Um, Nick works on studying how the, these like AI systems we're building today and relying on today um, rely on human generated data, how this might create negative impacts on society, uh, as particularly on the humans who are generating this data, uh, and how and Nick's particular work uh, looks at how to get people more aware of the data that is and how it's being used to train these AI systems, how to empower people to better leverage the data and understand the value of their data uh, as it's you know, really, really critical uh, for these systems that, that are being um, developed today uh, and possibly uh, provide guidelines for how we can sign AI that mitigates these sort of um, inequalities or, or, or like negative consequences. Um, so very pertinent to the work that we do at AI2. Um, Nick primarily publishes in, has published many works in like CSCW, uh, IC, ICWSM, um, CHI, and I believe a best paper award at CHI mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I guess without further ado, Nick, why don't you uh, take it away? Oh, and sorry, um, Nick is okay with interruptions for clarification questions during the talk, um, but there are regular checkpoints in this talk. Uh, so if you can reserve your questions for then, um, that would be best. Um, so go ahead and I'll turn it over to you, Nick. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that, was, that was such a great intro. Um, yeah. So hi, everyone. I'll just jump right in. Uh, I'm Nick Vincent. I'm extremely excited uh, to share my work today on data leverage, a framework for empowering the public to mitigate harms of artificial intelligence. Um, so to start off, I'm going to um, just share a little bit about the methods and the discipline, the methods I use and the disciplines that I kind of relate to, um, which relates to that intro as well. So my work kind of includes observational and descriptive analyses of large data sets um, with papers in places like Kai um, and also the new NeurIPS data set track, looking at things like Wikipedia, Reddit, um, the book corpus data set. I've also pursued a long, uh, long line of work on search engine auditing, um, doing building software to audit search engines uh, and publishing that in places like ICWSM. And then finally, my recent work has been heavily in the machine learning space, but with an emphasis on a data-centric view of intelligent systems and thinking about the interplay of machine learning and uh, collective action by data creators. And so I work specifically, I've, I've touched on things like recommender systems, uh, data valuation, um, and publish this work at places like the web conference, uh, the fact conference, uh, CSCW. Uh, I also occasionally use content analysis in some of these studies, and I'm currently working on um, building tools for users. And I'm gonna come back to that at the end. So I also, I'll talk now a little bit about the motivation for my work. So ever since I started grad school, um, I've been very excited about the potential of AI, uh, but concerned about potential negative impacts, uh, especially the likelihood for major inequality in, in power and wealth resulting from AI systems. At the same time, I became very interested in the underappreciated value of data. So for instance, there's been a growing evidence since when I started grad school that Wikipedia is, is really, really central dependency for much of modern AI, especially NLP and knowledge graphs, but other areas too. Um, and then also kind of on a related note when discussing search and recommendation, uh, I felt that many people undervalued the role of the trace data provided by the people who are actually receiving recommendations and, and acting upon them. This untapped uh, value, however, has an upside. Uh, it's a potential new source of collective power, uh, which could help to mitigate those negative impacts. So a key hypothesis for me and, and my work is that with better designed AI systems, uh, people can use that collective power that emerges from their data contributions to uh, work towards mutually beneficial relationships for both the data creators or, or data subjects, if you will, uh, enjoy prosperity alongside the AI operator. So better AI, better AI that um, everyone benefits from. Um, so right now, the data economy or the, the way that data is kind of uh, traded and bandied about is, is kind of characterized by uh, extreme information asymmetry. So the choices that people are making about what AI systems that they will support with data or not um, is, is basically reached where they know very little about the valuation of their data. They don't have the info to make individual assessments of, of their data value, let alone the many possible combinatorial evaluations uh, of combining their data with all sorts of possible coalitions of other people. And so uh, when I started this research, the discussion around negative impacts of computing uh, and the concerns about big tech and this information asymmetry, it was really just getting started. 
even going back to 2018, there was actually a lot of pushback uh, when talking about negative impacts. Um, so it's very exciting that since then, this discussion has become a lot more mainstream, as you probably noticed uh, in the media and in academic conferences. I um, mean, it's shifted quite a bit, and there's quite a bit, bit of media attention in the area. Um, and I've been really fortunate. I've actually gotten to talk to, to quite a few journalists uh, about my work. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to see that discussion shift. And if you want to read uh, one of these afterwards to get like a really quick summary of some of my work, if my, uh, my talk didn't do it for you, I'd recommend the MIT Tech Review piece, which um, we, we really loved uh, that, that piece and how it covered many of the things that we're thinking about. Um, so, okay, back to these growing concerns around tech. So one of the prominent concerns is that computing is and will continue to be an amplifier of economic inequality um, via automation, via superstar effects, the concentration of wealth, and perhaps other factors that we haven't even identified yet. Um, however, there's also other harms stemming from uh, computing systems and tech company practices, uh, such as things like um, systems that amplify historical inequalities, uh, changing notions of privacy, threats to, to democratic processes, and then also uh, new long-term environmental threats, uh, all of which you know, uh, lots of researchers in the field have, have started to really document and, and even suggest solutions to um, pretty recently. Um, so my research ha has been very targeted at addressing these concerns. Uh, that is information asymmetry and this power imbalance and all the kind of downstream harms. Uh, and, and I really hope to help address these issues at a structural level um, versus a symptomatic level. And, and this is a really big uh, ambitious goal. Um, Obviously, I think this will be a long-term goal with a lot of collective effort, but I'm very proud in my, in my grad career, I've been able to kind of break this up into a strategy with two components and kind of find bite-sized chunks or paper-sized chunks uh, to, to work on this problem. So those two components are, are one, measure the value of existing data sources, um, and then two, support collective action around data value. So in this talk, I'm gonna first talk about measuring um, and the specific projects I'll discuss. I'll walk very briefly uh, through some of my past work at CHI, at ICWSM, and at CSCW uh, that all measure the value of Wikipedia data specifically to platforms like Reddit and search engines. And I'll talk a little bit more about why Wikipedia, how this generalizes. Um, and all this work is supported by the framework of data labor, which I'm also gonna talk about as well. And for this first half, I'll cover it pretty quickly because I, this presentation is mainly gonna be focused more on the second half, uh, where I talk about this key framework of, of data leverage um, and a framework for kind of types of collective action and then how we could use uh, machine learning experiment methods to, to simulate collective action and maybe maybe support it and make it easier um, to mitigate the, those negative impacts. And I'll, I'm gonna close with a discussion of, of future work that kind of bounces around between all these spaces and that I, I'm really excited about and I, I hope uh, you'll find exciting as well. So before I jump into any specific studies, um, I want to introduce the very formative data as labor concept. Um, and actually there's kind of checkpoint number one, if there was already questions in the first nine slides uh, or, or problems or I'm talking too loud or anything like that, uh, happy to take them now, but. Cool, all right, I will just jump right in. So data is labor, this concept. So the main idea, uh, the public is providing a huge amount of the data that fuels uh, data, data dependent technologies. Um, and so this idea has been called data labor and the reliance on data labor means that the public has two distinct connections to tech company profits. So first uh, people act as consumers, buying products, viewing ads, um, et cetera, very familiar. But then of course many firms make more money uh, from their products and from their services by deploying intelligent technologies that could be anything from a regression that's driving business decisions to um, a massive neural network that's doing classification or generating text um, and helping them make more money somehow. And so that means that most people actually have this less appreciated role as uh, data laborers. When they write reviews, they click search results, they watch videos, they like tweets, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Any, almost any click and any post um, could potentially be used to fuel intelligent tech. Um, and so I don't know how many managers are on the call right now, but I have some bad news, which is that everyone on the call here is moonlighting because we all kind of work for Google and Microsoft and um, Meta slash Facebook and, uh, and Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this data is labor concept, it owes much to these books, Who Owns the Future in Radical Markets? Um, and then there was some academic work in the space. And today some actors have continued to build on, on this, including this uh, nonprofit called Radical Exchange. Uh, this is a group that I've worked with, been really formative to me. Um, and I was, I was very uh, excited that I got the chance to work on some multimedia around this concept as well. So there's also a podcast in the video uh, if you like that kind of uh, form and you wanna learn more about some of these ideas. And it's all on my website. Um, so really quick, as an example of, of data labor, what am I talking about here? Uh, let's think about search engines. And so we can actually say that search engines rely on two distinct classes of data labor. So there's explicit data labor. People create content like Wikipedia articles or they write a Stack Exchange answer. They write a Yelp review. Um, and in all these cases, you know you're doing it. I, I know that I, I wanna edit a Wikipedia article. I can't do it accidentally. 
Um, and these are all things that could potentially actually populate a search result. This would be the answer to a search query is the Stack Exchange answer. Um, but then also people provide behavioral data like, like clicks, um, the decision to dwell on a particular search result, some kind of pattern in browsing. And these are all critical for, for ranking the content. Um, and you know, it's basically just as important or else uh, it'd be really hard to, to rank that content and, and make the search engine work. If we get more specific and, and talk about, say, an academic search engine, uh, perhaps of interest, then we can identify uh, more specific parallels. So the content itself is, is academic articles, which requires uh, you know, uh, lots and lots of labor, as I'm sure if you all, are, all know and are perhaps familiar with, especially around uh, this time of year. Um, but then the ranking also requires academics to sit down at a computer, to think hard, to click things. I'm kind of you know, aggregating over a lot of life experiences when I sit down and sift through some paper abstracts or something like that. It seems almost silly, but it's actually, actually quite deep. And of course, if people stopped doing either thing, the system would perform worse. So a key idea in my work is taking the dependence and sensitivity of intelligence systems uh, to data labor or to data more broadly, uh, just taking that very seriously. So just one more example, um, uh, thinking of a language model. So a language model uh, typically for a training set needs people to actually write text. So maybe um, typing up you know, some thoughts on Reddit or writing a post on Twitter or I write a, a book or a blog. Um, but we also have to make choices about data inclusion slash sampling slash curation. And that can reflect data labor too. Um, so for instance, if we choose Reddit as a data source, but then we filter by score, uh, we're kind of making this choice to use to treat Reddit upvoters as this kind of voting public who are going to uh, pick what's in the training set. They may not have realized that they were in this voting public, um, but they are, and that, that's kind of what happens. In a more recent case, uh, Reddit text was filtered based on the length of a comment chain. Um, and so that means that in this case, uh, a response, if you respond to a comment on Reddit, you are voting to include that in the data set, even if you, uh, you know, maybe you were really mad at what that person was saying and, and you hate everything about that post, too bad your engagement was voting to, to include it in the data set. Um, so th there can be some problems with, with all this as well. Um, okay, so that was kind of the background on data as labor. Um, here's another checkpoint. Any, uh, any questions so far on that or stuff that folks would like to hear more about? I have a question about what labor means. Yeah. Like a, a search engine is something that attempts to sort the internet for you. So it can only kind of work with, re with respect to a person wanting sort of results. So it seems, yep. it seems collaborative to me in that case. Is labor just any work performed by anyone? Yeah, so the labor analogy here is more so, and I think this will maybe uh, make more sense when I introduce, like why is this useful or relevant? will make more sense when I introduce some of the studies. Um, the, the labor parallel is mainly the idea that I have a choice to pick Google or Bing. And the one that I pick to use, I will probably help make that better um, for the other people out there like me. And I'll also make them make more money. Um, so yeah, and actually I will definitely return to this question of like, it seems like calling stuff labor that you can really get into the weeds with this. And this can be a very you know, deep and, and passionate conversation about definitions and definitions are important to academics. Um, but yeah, the short answer is basically it's about helping them make money and this idea that you kind of have a choice of who to work for. Okay, thanks. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, wait, let me pause back, see if, uh, I'm also, I'm full screen, screen over here, so I, I can't see like raised hands. I hope that's okay. So just feel free to yell at me. Um, I can also moderate in case there's awesome. some. Awesome, thank you. Thanks. Cool, all right, I will hop right on and now I'm gonna talk about Wikipedia and measuring value. So in my early work, um, I investigated the idea that online platforms like Reddit and Stack Overflow and uh, search engines like Google and Bing are highly reliant on user generative content from other platforms. Um, and so this is where I use observational data analysis on large open data sets like Wikipedia, Reddit, Stack Exchange, um, specifically that was all in one paper. And then I also employed uh, search auditing where, which provides us kind of a nice and simple way to count the prevalence of Wikipedia content in high profile places, uh, like the top of widely queried search engine result pages or, um, or SERPs as I'll, as I'll call them uh, hereafter. Um, so in work with Isaac Johnson and Brent Hecht, we looked at the role that uh, Wikipedia links played in generating engagement um, and therefore revenue for Stack Overflow and Reddit. So we considered an upper bound scenario. So where we imagine that all posts with Wikipedia links disappear entirely in a world without Wikipedia. And then we use that to estimate what would be the loss in upvotes and comments and views, um, et cetera. We also consider a lower bound scenario where say, okay, if Wikipedia for some reason didn't exist anymore, Maybe all those posts would still exist, but their engagement would drop off to a level of uh, similar non-Wikipedia linking posts. So to estimate this kind of like treatment effect of Wikipedia disappearing, we used a propensity score uh, match regression. And the key point uh, from both was that in, in either kind of scenario, it definitely seems like Wikipedia provides tons of value outside Wikipedia. And actually, so using voting patterns as a proxy for engagement and then doing some 
uh, kind of back of the napkin math to try to estimate what does that turn into in terms of revenue. Um, we're, we're pretty sure that Wikipedia is providing on the order of around $100,000 of extra ad revenue per year. Um, so not, not subsidizing all the revenue by any means, but also uh, much, much, much greater than zero. And then we also did see some boosts back to Wikipedia. So kind of a symbiotic ecosystem where right after a, good, a big post would show up on Reddit, um, there'd be more edits to that post on, on Wikipedia. Um, so there's some kind of symbiosis here, but definitely major evidence that volunteer labor on one platform can drive a lot of activity elsewhere. And so this is an idea that we really carried forward, um, moving towards more data labor work on the machine learning side. Uh, so I've also conducted several search engine audits aimed at understanding how often uh, search engine results pages, SERPs, um, serve user-generated content, and especially Wikipedia. So in a 2019 paper, uh, we collected search results and investigated all kinds of UGC. So Wikipedia, Twitter, Yelp, we, uh, we looked at them manually, we did some content analysis, uh, but really the headline finding here was that Wikipedia was dominating everything else. There's, there's a lot of UGC, but Wikipedia was showing up so much, it was on the order of things like, uh, like Google's own widgets, like Google Maps, or the news carousel. Uh, so in a follow-up study, we developed new software to measure the spatial incidence rate, um, which is how often Wikipedia content or other content too, but we use it for Wikipedia, is appearing um, above the fold on a search engine result page or on the right-hand side of a SERP. And then we use that to look at Wikipedia links. Um, in that study, in that second study, we also wanted to build on the prior work on some other dimensions, not just this spatial incident rate, rate stuff. Uh, so we looked at search engines beyond Google, and we also uh, simulated mobile devices to see what happens if you go to Bing, what happens if you're searching on your phone, which uh, increasingly people are. And so for instance, here's a search I made uh, for the NBA pretty recently. I get this nice little widget with some live scores, uh, but I also get a Wikipedia link. Is that happening often? Uh, also note, I picked this screenshot in particular. I figured, you know, on the West Coast, probably some Warriors fans in the crowd, so maybe I could garner some goodwill. I grew up in San Jose. Um, so just a little fun there. Uh, but to understand the incidence of Wikipedia more broadly, we collected search results for a variety of important queries. Um, so specifically, we, we got high volume queries. We got these from an SEO company that, that publishes a big list of these. We got trending queries, uh, which we just scraped from Google Trends itself. And then we got medical queries that are uh, being actually released with a prior academic paper. And um, we use these uh, to calculate these spatial incidence rates, which are really useful because modern SERPs are quite a mess. There's tons of widgets, um, and I, I picked an intentionally wild one here um, to, to really drive it home. And hidden in all these widgets are Wikipedia links. So on this messy, messy grid, uh, which is showing every single you know, HTML A element on this SERP, um, the Wikipedia links are in green. So we do this for a bunch of different SERPs and we map them all to a grid and then calculate the spatial incidence rates. And high level, we confirm that Wikipedia has very high incidence, not just on Google, not just for desktop users. Uh, so this bar chart is showing, showing rates in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s for um, common queries and trending queries, a lot lower for medical. I'll definitely note that. Um, and we did see as well that um, queries and devices matter. So for instance, above the fold incidence, much higher on desktop than mobile, not surprising because the desktop screen, much bigger. Um, and there was also, by comparing the left-hand and the right-hand rates, we saw that, for instance, those knowledge panel elements um, are a key result, but not the only one. Um, OK, so that was just a little bit about measuring uh, the value, basically measuring how much is Wikipedia showing up as a proxy for how much is Wikipedia driving all this search activity. Um, and now I'm going to talk in more depth about some papers that are aimed at supporting collective action. Um, and so this is where I'm going to uh, go a bit deeper. So first, I'll introduce this idea of data leverage um, from a 2021 fact paper. And this is a framework that we've been developing to think about all kinds of, of different collective action, kind of what options are out there for people. Um, so in this paper, we set out to categorize and evaluate uh, different ways that members of the public can exert leverage through their data contributing behavior. And we wanted to pull together an array of concepts that can all be usefully applied to this space of responsible AI. Um, so we're pulling on things like data scaling, learning curves, data poisoning uh, from machine learning. We're pulling on use and non-use from, from HCI and CSEW. This is the idea of kind of studying why people stop using a platform or quit a social media platform. We're drawing on data portability from, from law and policy. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the whole framework first, and then I'll return to some studies that really deep dive on this framework with, with experiments, um, some of which came first, some of which were kind of simultaneous. So to reiterate the key idea here, um, because data-dependent technologies rely on the public, the public has the ability to make these technologies worse or to make a competitor's technologies better. And this is a potential source of leverage because um, this is something that the people in power might, might care about. So this could really plausibly, if you make a big enough dent on the recommender system ad revenue, the CEO might listen to you. So putting it kind of cutely with a long enough lever, uh, you and your friends, you and your broader network might be able to move uh, larger firms. So to give it a formal definition, data leverage is 
the power to influence a, a company held by those who implicitly or explicitly contribute data on which that company relies. What does it actually look like, you might ask? Well, at a high level, we can basically think of data leverage examples as falling into two buckets. So either you're, a group of people are going to bring down a system that's operated by their leverage target, um, or they're going to boost up a technology that helps another organization compete with the target of leverage. Um, so either withholding and deleting or, or redirecting and generating new data. Um, and so this is a really exciting thing uh, kind of conceptually about data leverage is that regardless of whether you think a particular example, say clicking a search link um, is labor or not, uh, and there's, you know, there's all sorts of machine learning tasks out there. And so we could really sit down and you know, go through hundreds of them and, and kind of see, I think this looks more like labor than that one. Regardless of all that, and regardless of arguments about which people deserve credit for a piece of data, so if it is my DNA data that's shared with you know, lots of people in my family, how are we gonna figure out who deserves the most credit for that? Um, forget all of that, we can always, if we wanna kind of move forward productively, constructively, we can ask who has the agency to impact the outcomes of downstream technologies. And this really lets us talk about these issues um, in very testable and falsifiable manners. So we can say, what data contributions do you have the ability to, to withhold, to delete, to modify, to transfer, to create a new? And we can think in terms of technology impacting actions. Um, and so now that I've set the stage a little bit, I'll get into one of the main contributions of the fact paper, which is defining three clear categories of data leverage. We call them data levers. Uh, recurring theme I'll use here is that each lever is kind of a tool in the public's tool belt. And another key point is that these are tools that can be strengthened. So new laws, research artifacts, um, we believe in changes to how technologies are designed, can all kind of boost the power. Um, and also before I dive into these three types, um, any questions about um, any of this so far? Yeah, Nick, I had one question. Um, yes. uh, around when you're talking about sort of uh, data leverage and, and who has agency to impact, uh, I guess, these companies. Um, yeah. Are you talking about uh, like possibly like trying to quantify this on like an individual level or on like a group collective level? I guess I was just trying to understand the granularity of who I should be assessed. Yeah. They should be assessed for leverage. So I, I, I love that question. My, uh, <laughs> this is like relates a lot to kind of my research trajectory, which early on I was really interested and I still am really interested in kind of work that looks at data value at an individual level. Um, and so I'll come back to this a little bit at the end to the kind of this whole category of data valuation work. So using things like influence functions and Shapley values to try to estimate things about, oh, if this you know observation number 99 is pulled out of the training set, how does the test loss change? You know, How does it change for test set one or test set two? Um, and people have talked about using these, these values to kind of assign credit scores and, and pay people maybe money for data or you know, trying to say you're the biggest contributor or you help the most or, or maybe you hurt the most in some cases. Um, but so we, we've done some work on that and we create like basically uh, myself and many of my collaborators in this space are increasingly uh, like leaning towards data valuation being most interesting at the collective level. So it's much more, it, it can be interesting and I think there are uses to doing the individual stuff. But um, finding ways to support collective action and then thinking about this in terms of groups is, is totally the way to go. Because I think we all know that of course, um, you know, that data's value is, is combinatorial. There's, uh, you know, for any given data set, there's a lot of ways that you can rearrange it and, and you know, different coalitions of users. Um, so yeah, short answer. Uh, the short answer is groups. And I'm gonna come back to like some more reasons why I'm excited about that uh, at, at the end. And this is also one of the things that I kind of have ongoing work on as well. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I will dive into the different data levers now. So we can basically, again, think about it either a group wants to lower some technology's performance or boost up another, uh, a competitor. And um, a point that I'm also gonna return to later is that data leverage can, can really be seen as kind of a, I believe it can be seen as a distributed way of aligning AI systems with the public's kind of ethical values or, or other values. So if, if it's true that there's not huge information asymmetry, and if it's true that people have meaningful opportunities to, to do kind of the building blocks of data leverage, if I can really realistically at no at a low cost to myself do things like remove my uh, ratings from a recommender system data set, remove my search queries from a search data set, et cetera, um, or remove my, my face from an from a image classifier, things like that. We would expect over time, there should be just generally a shift towards technologies that people agree with at scale. Um, but that's kind of like, uh, I think a relatively uncontroversial, but also, also testable hypothesis. Um, and so this, this is, all three of these data levers can kind of help to do that, in my opinion. And this is uh, kind of a big, kind of broad, crazy idea that I'm, I'm very excited about exploring more. So with that said, back to our categories. 
So we got this lower performance bucket with two levers in it. So there's data strikes and data poisoning. Um, and then over in the boost performance bucket, we have conscious data contribution, um, or just data contribution if you prefer that instead, or CDC, um, which is an acronym that we picked before the CDC appeared in a lot of news headlines. I, I will just you know give that disclaimer. So in a data strike, a group of people withhold or delete their data to lower a technology's performance. Uh, you can imagine people using um, maybe fake accounts to watch YouTube videos so that their view data can't be tied to the real account. Um, you could think of tracking blockers, privacy enhancing technologies, and you could think of data deletion requests. And a lot of this stuff was uh, was was very implausible when we started this work, um, but it's become a lot more plausible now. And in fact, there's things like the right to erasure. There's um, some legislation in California that that folks at Consumer Reports are working to make it way easier for Californians to do deletion requests. So it could be you know coming to the states pretty soon. Um, and there's also a lot of concerns people had uh, when I brought this up that companies are just going to delete their training data but keep their model weights or keep their embeddings and use it for a bunch of other tasks or you know have one giant pre-trained model but delete all the training data. Um, we could call this like data laundering. That's what that's what we call it internally. Um, but it actually seems that there's increasing evidence that the government, at least in the US and probably elsewhere, is actually going to enforce the deletion of weights and embeddings and, and things like that. And so this gives data strikes a lot more heft. Um, so that second lever is data poisoning. Basic idea here is to provide data that is deceptive and uh, kind of you know causes the machine learning model to fail in some manner. And, and of course, this is this is the most familiar to the machine learning world for quite some time. Uh, you know, there's decades of papers on this topic. Um, and examples here could range from clicking like on a video that you actually hate um, to or maybe I go and save. You know, I go into Semantic Scholar and you know save a bunch of papers that I never ever want to read because they're from the most faraway discipline that I could possibly imagine. I don't know what that would be, um, but for the sake of example. And then it could range to things like making pixel level manipulations to photos where I go find some bleeding edge paper on archive and they say, oh, the top, we figured out the secret is to make some assumptions about how they're training their model and manipulate this pixel in the top left corner. Um, and that could work as well. So finally, the last lever, conscious data contribution, CDC, operates by boosting up a competitor's technology. And so the basic idea here is to transfer data to or create new data for someone that you want to help compete. We can think of this as a data analog to Conscious consumerism, that's what the, the name is trying to imply. Uh, instead of voting with your wallet, you vote with your data. So an example here might be downloading your purchase history from one platform to help a startup that you want to, um, to help compete and make better recommendations. And of course, you benefit from it too. So in the paper, we analyzed the likely factors that will affect how easy it is to use a particular data lever and arrived at this relative ranking. Uh, so we definitely think that data poisoning has the highest barrier to entry. Um, there's necessary knowledge about specific target systems. There's skills, there's a need for sustained efforts, there might be legal risks. Um, and of course, the poisoning attack might stop working when a new paper comes out. Um, for data strikes, there's definitely some reasons it would be hard to quit using a technology. Um, so participation may be dependent on data protection law or, um, or tools that make it easier to block trackers. Um, and then finally, CDC we think is actually probably easy to use. A person can keep using their current technologies while contributing data to other technologies. It does remain to be seen if people will want to do this, um, even if it's technically easy. And in some cases, it may require data portability law or data export features, because most people don't want to write a custom script um, or you know, fiddle around with someone else's script that's meant to extract data that they helped to contribute from one place to another. Um, and we took into consideration what we likely, uh, the likely legal and ethical challenges associated with each data lever. And it seems that data poisoning will have the most serious questions to answer. Um, it definitely involves acting deceptively and trying to get systems to fail in major ways. So there are immediate concerns about violating moral standards around deception. Could be illegal. Careful consideration, definitely need it. Um, for CDC, there's some concerns that uh, in some cases you might be wanting to exert leverage against a company because you think that their AI model is, is doing harm in the world. Um, and so, of course, you don't want to just boost up another company who's using the same kind of model to do similar kinds of harm in the world. Uh, so in that case, that, that would be pretty concerning. There's also big privacy considerations. It would not really be responsible to tell people to just start, you know, posting their Google takeout and their Facebook export uh, all over the web, or uploading them onto random forums, or uh, you know, putting their photo history onto random forums. This would be pretty irresponsible. So it's definitely going to require a lot of case by case consideration, and probably a good deal of like tool development and ed education as well. Finally, we believe, believe that data strikes are the easiest to justify, both morally and legally. Um, there's just a major alignment with privacy initiatives in terms of law and justification. People who are already using privacy protecting behaviors like um, an, an ad blocker or the Tor browser or things like that are basically doing data strikes. When people boycott a company because they think they're creepy, they're basically doing a data strike. Um, 
And so there's really kind of a win-win nice alignment here. Um, so to connect these ideas with the lever imagery, this is, this is kind of loose, of course, as well, but it's a little bit fun. So tech company practices over here on the right, heavy object, very hard to move, lots of reasons. We can think of data strikes as being a short lever, but a pretty big box because we think that it would be easy to get a lot of people um, to do a data strike. CDC is kind of a medium-sized lever and a medium-sized box. And then uh, data poisoning is this long lever with a tiny little box, and this is trying to show just 1% of users uh, engaging in a really sophisticated data poisoning attack could do a crazy amount of damage and really make a model fail in a catastrophic way. But once the data scientists figure it out, um, it kind of falls off and reduces back to a data strike because once you filter out that poison training data, you can just, you can just drop it um, and then you kind of move forward and that, that defense might be saved in, the, you know, in history forever. Uh, so now that I've walked through our framework, I'll zoom in a bit and talk about the earlier work which focused very closely on data strikes. And this is my first work that uh, really started to think seriously about collective action around data. At the time, uh, many people thought this concept was very implausible, seems a lot more plausible now. Um, so this is a 2019 web conference paper, and we set out to use machine learning simulation experiments to see what would happen in different data strike scenarios, um, specifically against a recommender system using the movie lens data. So we focused specifically on the movie lens data set, movie lens 1 million, and the surprise, it's a Python library, it's implementation of the really popular SVD um, algorithm. And the point here was just to do something standard. So a popular data set, a popular approach, um, no fancy bells and whistles. And so the task basically looks like this. Um, so we've got just a little example here, and Bob, Chen, and Dee. Um, and I didn't give the movies names here, so you can kind of you know, impose your favorite movies on top to make it a little more fun if you want to. And we know that Anne gave movie one a four-star rating. We want to know what does Anne think about movie two, using all our knowledge uh, at hand to do the best we can. Um, so when we started to think about what it looks like to kind of you know, delete, basically we can, we're deleting rows from this table, we run into a problem. So let's say that we have Anne and we have Bob. Anne boycotts the system. She says, I'm going to quit, never going to use it again, gets no recommendations. We can't even compute a metric like um, normalized discounted cumulative gain or root mean squared error, um, NDCG and RMSE, and which is which are things that people in other papers on the movie lens data set had, uh, had used a lot and are quite popular or were quite popular uh, at one time. And Anne buys no products and watches no ads. Uh, on the other hand, maybe Bob is going to do a data strike. So Bob keeps using the system, but does a deletion request, asks the government to say, make sure they delete all my data. Bob gets bad recommendations, which will be based on the, the mean ratings. Bob is basically a, a cold start user every single time, just getting uh, you know, recommended the thing with the highest mean rating in the system. Um, Bob's metrics are worse, but Bob's still buying products and watching ads. So it's very possible that if we looked just at those system level performance metrics, Bob the striker looks like a more effective protester than Anne the boycotter, um, because we need to have a metric that accounts for the fact that the boycott means no direct revenue at all. So we need a proxy for revenue. So we, um, we basically counted what we called surfaced hits. Uh, basically it's a precision at K, but each user's K is based on the total number of items they rated. So if I do, made a hundred ratings, I could contribute a hundred hits and someone who did only five can only contribute five. And so when the 100 rating person joins the boycott, um, it has a much bigger impact. And we did also consider uh, traditional metrics as well and kind of compared those in the paper. And so uh, first we, we compared this strike to a strike plus boycott. So here we have that surface hits on the y-axis, fraction of users who are striking or striking plus boycotting on the x-axis. And we see the stark contracts between boycotting and just deleting data. If you delete data but keep using the recommender, you'll get some hits um, even from the unpersonalized baseline, right? Even if I'm just recommending you the popular stuff, it's going to work sometimes. If you boycott, all the hits go away. So all this goes to say is that, of course, data strikes can be powerful. But there, if you if you have a hundred thousand users, you'd rather you'd rather have a hundred thousand users who give you no data than have zero users. Um, and of course, this is not taking into account the likelihood of people leaving as the model gets worse. But that's something that we want to look at uh, in future work with agent-based models that kind of give um, users and maybe even the operators some characteristics. So the more interesting thing, thing here is to zoom in and look at the effect of a strike just relative to the unpersonalized baseline. So we have at the top, the little black dotted line, that's the, uh, that's the starting performance with all data, no data strike. Uh, the red lot dotted line at the bottom is that recommend popular mean approach. And also we have on here the performance of uh, a model from 2001. So this item-based collaborative filtering uh, paper that was super, super influential. And so from this plot, we can see that if 30% of users data strike, in terms of surface hits, we get halfway to that unpersonalized baseline. Um, we're kind of sending our, our performance back in time. And so th this actually suggests that, of course, you'd rather 
have your all your users go away if you want to do maximum damage. But even if everyone stays in the system, you can you can really bring that performance down a lot towards that unpersonalized baseline. Um, so after diving deep on data strikes, uh, we moved on to another. But before I go on, this is also another good checkpoint. If anyone wants to ask about that that um, project in particular, cool. I will keep running. So simulating data leverage more broadly. Um, so we wanted to explore context other than just recommender systems and also take into this consideration the idea that, hey, maybe data contribution itself um, could be a form of data leverage. So this work was in kind of in parallel with that framework uh, that I already walked through. So for this paper, we considered a lot more tasks. And here's just a, a very quick overview. Uh, in short, it's a couple recommendation tasks. One is a, one is a rating estimation. One is a, a 0, 1 interaction prediction or implicit um, recommendation. There's an image classification data set. There's a Wikipedia. And we actually took the code from from a couple papers who shared their uh, their code and also from a blog post and from a Kaggle data set. And so we built on top of all of these open source implementations to run simulations of data strikes in CDC. Our simulation scenario is assuming the existence of two companies. So we say there's large co and there's small co. Small co starts with no data and large co starts with a full data set. And so in our simulation, large co can lose data when people data strike and small co can gain when they contribute. And then we consider these three combinations where there's just a strike, there's just uh, you know contribution to small co, and then also this like extreme scenario where people delete their data from large co and give it to small co. They're so angry, uh, they're so motivated. And so we we wanted to define some kind of data leverage power, some kind of metric that would allow us to compare how much power do the users have um, across different contexts. And so to do that, we started with two definitions. So that we said the baseline performance that's going to be the random guess or the recommend most popular. Um, basically, it's what small co would use. And then the best case performance is how good can you get when you have all the data possible so that the full um, you know, benchmark data set that folks are using in, in the literature. And that's where large code starts. And then we set up data leverage power. We, we, this is our kind of our desirable qualities. We want a data leverage power of zero to mean that the users had no effect on performance at all. They didn't boost small code. They didn't harm large code. And a DLP of one means that data leverage boosted small code all the way up to the best case or dragged down large code all the way down to the worst case. Um, so basically what it is, is DLP is just a linear transformation of the relevant machine learning performance metrics. So we picked whatever the, uh, the prior work had done. Um, and so concretely, it would basically look like this. You kind of are, are just normalizing it relative to the best. Um, L here is the loss, or, or it could be accuracy, or kind of any sort of metric you like. Um, or you're normalizing it relative to the minimum. How much is it boosting up? How much is it dragging down? Uh, and if you're interested, I can also come back. I have an interactive artifact that kind of walks through this a little bit more that I'm, I'm super excited about that I could share at the end. Um, so why are we doing this again? Just uh, to explain that a little more. It's really nice because this metric now is agnostic to ML evaluation choices. It's on a scale of zero to one. So we can sit, kind of see how powerful is a group of users trying to go against a Rexis that uses RMSE versus a classifier that uses accuracy. It lets us compare data strikes and data contribution, um, which is really nice. And then, of course, we still want to consider the underlying metrics again. This is just an addition. Um, so here is some of the experiment results uh, from these simulations. So a lot going on here. On the left-hand side, we have a bunch of plots showing that DLP metric um, for those three scenarios, just con contribution, just deletion, and both contribute and delete. Um, and so the x-axis is showing participation going from 0 to 1. So either no one participates or everyone participates. And uh, on the right-hand side, we have just the raw performance metrics, so hit rate, RMSE, accuracy, and um, AUC. And so these are very familiar uh, diminishing returns that you might expect to see in basically most machine learning and statistical contexts when you're drawing these learning curves, right? Uh, these are all just random samples. So here we're not trying to model like the social network that would go into forming a, a, a coalition. We're just taking the average across a bunch of experiments of um, a random sample of 10%, a random sample of 20%, et cetera. Um, but the reason that these are useful now is that we can make observations like this. We can zoom in and say, OK, looking at that Pinterest data set, 20% of users get small co 90% of the way to best case performance. But for the movie lens case, it takes 50% of users. Um, so this is basically a kind of reflecting the uh, the data efficiency of different tasks. So if we were to maybe fit a power law uh, to these curves, this would be you know related to the exponent of that power law. Um, but by the data leverage power is really nice because we can talk about this in terms of plausible real world um, collective action outcomes. 
Uh, and it's also, I will note, it's not a random sample of data points, but it's a random sample of users. So that's also, that is one area where this is not, this is not exactly the same as a typical learning curve uh, experiment or a data, like a data scaling power law experiment you might uh, be familiar with, but it's pretty similar. Um, so I, I'm personally quite hopeful that these kind of simulations would be really useful in helping activists to decide which systems are better targeted with a data strike um, and which systems are better targeted with data contribution based on the specific scaling properties of that system or that domain or that data set, et cetera. So I, I really do think that these kind of simulations can, can be quite useful in that regards. Um, we can also think about this just from a simple learning curve plot, so not going into all that DLP stuff. Here we just have test accuracy versus fraction of data available. And if we look here, so in this particular case, if 20% of people engage in a data strike, that's basically kind of tracing the curve left from um, its, you know, its apex. And that has almost no impact at all because we're already in that flat region of diminishing returns. Collecting more data is not that useful at this point. But if 20% of users engage in data contribution, they could bring this small company that just started um, its image classification accuracy from the 10% random guess baseline up to 80%. And that's actually reduced the, the disparity quite a bit. So there's kind of this nice narrative where maybe data contribution, you can really reap those early, early rewards, that vertical part of a you know, characteristic um, diminishing returns curve. So kind of putting that in terms of potential impact, we could say that data strikes probably start out weak and accelerate. Data contribution starts out strong and decelerates. Um, and this has important implications and connections to collective action theory. And so this is also something that I'm super excited about incorporating into this work right now. Uh, this is basically sociologists who are interested in kind of theorizing, excuse me, theorizing about how um, people engage in collective action, whether that happens in an accelerating or a decelerating faction, fashion. Um, so now I'm, I want to talk about next steps for the rest of the time that we have. But first, I would love to answer some questions about the uh, about that section of the presentation, if uh, anyone has any. Uh, I have one, but um, feel free to tell me if you're going to talk about this later. But um, cool. one thing that I was uh, wondering, looking at your framework, is that um, it takes a very binary view on, on users, right? Either a user stays on a platform or leaves a platform um, versus, um, you know, uh, someone might decide to contribute as little as possible to a platform because there is some value in that platform. Or even they could shift uh, to like new platform in a way that it's like not randomly distributed, right? You, you shift most of your usage, but there's this old platform that there's something that really can be beaten so that you're you're locked there. Um, so the one thing in general, like is that a direction that you are interested in taking this work or like how this fits with the existing framework and so on? Yeah, I love that that, that I love that question. Um a hundred percent. So I, I definitely I think that um you're totally right that the binary view is the wrong way to go and will basically kind of scare people off from being interested in this kind of thing. Um, because it's way easier, let's say maybe in the Twitter case, right? Um, I don't know. I like to use Twitter a lot. I don't know if anyone else here does. Let's say that someone is trying to convince you they're like, I'm not happy about the change of management in Twitter. I think we got to move to Mastodon or you know, some maybe a centralized competitor or something like that, right? And I say, ah, you know, every morning I wake up and I check Twitter, I can't do it. And they say, okay, just switch on Fridays, just for Fridays only. Come on. And then maybe this is where that that collective action theory comes in. Maybe we can make a browser extension where people kind of pledge, and I can see, oh, all my friends are also pledging to do Mastodon on Friday, and we're going to kind of, you know, build into it. So there's like a whole horde of, of habit building and like kind of, um, you know, social social nudges and, and the way that you know social that being in social situations influences our behavior. Um, that I think we can totally use it as an advantage. And I agree that like s implying that people have to, you know, engage in a radical data poisoning attack or you know quit every platform immediately. Is, is totally unrealistic and will not really build any, any critical mass or excitement around these ideas at all. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love the idea of kind of having gradual shifts for sure. Yeah, and or, or I just wonder like how that impacts the analysis, right? If I stop shopping on, on Amazon for anything, everything except, I don't know, my favorite granola bar because they're only sold on Amazon, uh, that's, that's like super, yes, and, and maybe like, uh, throwing away 90% of my data on Amazon or whatever, but uh, that's like a very valuable data point that I'm now leaving on Amazon because I'm still buying that thing there. Um, so I wonder like how much that would, would change analysis. Yeah, this is an area I, I would love to simulate as well. Um, it, it kind of relates to one area also that like, so if you look at the numbers um, in these like 
data sets that academics, uh, or at least that graduate students such as myself ha have access to, these are a small amount of users, right? Movie Lens a million is, is 6,000 users. Um, 20 million is, is more than that, but they're small, right? And the, the Pinterest data set, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's not, it's not that much. It's not as much as Google and Facebook, not as much as YouTube, et cetera. Um, and so if you try to apply this to the scale of Amazon, all this maybe sounds you know, moot, moot and useless anyway, but I would say that there are lots of, if you imagine you know, Amazon as having, if you try to describe all of Amazon's products with one gi giant user item matrix, right? There's probably lots of basically sub tasks within there. Like maybe there are, you know, there's a bunch of, um, people love specialty coffee and there's a big community of people who buy rare specialty coffees on Amazon. And this perhaps doesn't have a lot of correlations with other stuff. There's just like not a lot of correlations in buying coffee with other stuff. Well, there probably are, are small correlations with all of them, but maybe it's, it's mostly kind of, you know, isolated. So what I would say is that if you want to affect Amazon tomorrow, find something like that, right? Try to get these kind of like enthusiasts or these like, um, you know, most extreme users. And we did look at this in the data strikes paper a little bit where we tried to say like, what if all the people who are big fans of, of horror movies, um, you know, do a data strike? Will that, will that have like above expected impact? And generally it did, but not all the time. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of what you'd imagine where like, if you have mostly popular tastes, then your, your data is kind of like more redundant in a sense. Um, and I think there's like, there's a whole crazy, uh, there's a lot of dimensions to go down here in this space that would be like really useful generally for just understanding the characteristics of, of recommender systems and search engines as well. Um, so I, I, my kind of broad answer to this is that like, I'd love to see that. I think that we should totally simulate that. And I think that the, the user level, like unit of analysis is something that's like not really been done a lot. And so like is a useful theoretical construct for starting to, to talk about these things. Um, yeah. <laughs> Cool, thank you. Um, cool. All right, let's see. I will hop into uh, some of the stuff I'm excited about. So three areas I'll just touch on briefly about ongoing and future work. Um, and I'll connect them back to my big goal. So I uh, am working and want to keep working on building data leverage assistance. Um, I'm really interested broadly in data valuation and this idea of data dividends, finding ways to kind of measure the value and maybe give give some of that back in, in some sense, maybe monetary, but not necessarily. And then uh, Kind of cutting across both of these, as I mentioned, um, I, I really think that leverage can be a great way to kind of do AI values alignment. Um, broadly, I, I know that like AI alignment is, is its own term or field, and my version of it is a little bit different, but I think that it is getting at the same thing, which is over time, slowly but surely, getting AI systems that broadly align with, with uh, you know, uh, ethical values that are popular in, in human society. Um, but I'm not also saying to let all, all AI systems, you know, be subjected to Twitch plays Pokemon. Uh, absolutely not. I'll come back to that too if there's time. Um, so data leverage assistance um, in our paper, we kind of lay out this vision of something that's like a website. Maybe it allows you to go search for ongoing social movements, um, which would draw on, on search technology studies of social movements. And then there's a browser extension maybe, and there's a data strike option and a data poisoning option. It will do things like tell you, oh, here's a tracking blocker you should download. Here's a um, something you should download that will help you do fake interactions. Here's something you could download that will back up all your data so that when you are browsing, you can easily generate a version of browsing history for yourself. Um, and then, and I think that the part that I'm most interested in right now is, can it tell you about the likely impact of your actions? So can I communicate to you, if you and 100 of your friends do this, here's what will happen to the model. And that's where all those, those simulations come in. And that's where doing things like simulating, okay, I'm gonna cut away 90% of my shopping on Amazon, but I'm still gonna shop, I'm still gonna buy the granola bars well, what's the difference between that 90 and that 100%? Is, my, is that granola bar critical or not? Can we try to get at that simulations? So I've been working on right now is building tools to visualize that. So for instance, this uh, prototype using observable notebooks that lets users kind of play around with a, a very simplified view of data leverage. So this, the, here, this curve is actually just a, um, it's just based on the results of scaling law papers. So it's just a, literally a power law plotted, but in such a way that it's, it's quite interactive and you can kind of uh, play around with it. Um, and there's a, this is right for HCI work in figuring out what uh, actually you know, tells people about how much impact they have, you know, what is actually reducing that information asymmetry. Um, so on the data valuation side, there's this, uh, there's this problem of trying to tell people about their ability to impact AI performances. Which data valuation metric do you use? So there's lots of cool papers in this space. Um, so influence functions are one way of doing this. Shapley values are another. And there's a, some other competing things as well. Uh, there's the least core, which is a, an idea from competitive game theory. Um, Basically, all these compete as different ways to try to say this observation deserves this much value, or you know this will be the impact of removing this. Um, and this could also be used for like data markets. So, for instance, the Microsoft had this Trove experiment, which was paying people for data. 
like a crowdsourcing market um, that I worked on a little bit and, and thought about trying to incorporate this in uh, to a certain extent. And so you could use this for a lot of things. People in the in the theoretical machine learning literature are kind of just interested in it as a theoretical construct or for identifying um, bad training data or outliers or um, distribution shift. But another use case is doing a data dividend. So maybe we could solve all those problems that I talked at the beginning by just paying people for data. Could we use data and AI as kind of like a way of doing progressive economic policy? And if we're gonna do that, do we need to figure out how much value each person contributed? So I actually have some ongoing work on the implications of different data valuation. Um, and there's a lot of ways to extend this. And I will say this is a real thing. So one area that I've worked on is this data dividend project with the Bergrun Institute. Um, and we are actually working on kind of writing out a full proposal. Um, I do want to allow time for more questions. So I think I'm going to go a little bit quicker at the end here and then maybe just come back if, if folks are interested in a particular part. So in my ongoing work, I'm thinking about the different dimensions of this data dividend and also thinking about um, how do we actually get, so let's say we have these loss changes. So maybe, you know, I have three people, person one had a negative one impact on the loss, person two had a zero impact and person three had a one. Uh, the example is, is pick to be nice. Well, there's a bunch of different ways that I can convert that into positive monetary amounts. I could shift it. I could take the absolute value. I could, I could clip it at zero. I could kind of bin it. You know, if you're above the median, you get two X. Um, and so in our ongoing work, that's, this is, we have a, a archive preprint of this, but not published yet um, formally. Uh, we basically find that across many popular binary classification tasks, um, if we imagine we're going to pay all the people who did those tasks based on these data values, um, that these really simple choices can lead to really low Gini indexes, indices, so low inequality, or really high. So it's totally possible to create a data economy in this manner that's more unequal than the regular economy. So it gets complicated really fast. It could be totally unfair uh, or very capricious, I guess. Um, and we all know that it's the aggregated data that's useful anyway, right? So maybe we should do collective data valuation um, instead of trying to say this one person deserves this much money. Um, if we are thinking about an AI artist model like a, like Dolly 2, maybe we could try to show the top 100 images that helped that AI artist produce an image to give some credit. Maybe it's not even about money. It's just about giving some credit or show the top 50 um, pieces of text that helped uh, you know, top 50 posts, perhaps that helped a, a large language model produce some other piece of text. And maybe there's other ways of recognizing and valuing contributors. So I, I, I'm really curious if anyone has ideas on the call, would love to return to that. And then uh, just two slides left here. So really quickly, I wanna talk about this idea that perhaps data leverage um, can be useful in, in achieving this AI values alignment. So if people have more agency to withhold, to redirect, et cetera, then over time, it seems likely that they would push AI systems in line with their values by supporting the ones that they don't and harming the ones, uh, supporting the ones that they do, harming the ones that they don't. Um, and maybe they would use this to push for things like data dividends. Maybe they would push for more privacy friendly models. This is also another area that I'm, I'm excited about and I've had a chance to work on a little bit at Snap Research as an intern. Um, and so maybe some alignment will happen naturally as, as new data laws and practices come into play. But I think there's a really exciting area um, for basically trying to provide goalposts for data agency that would accelerate this process. Um, so kind of like picking a particular system, like maybe an experimental language model and uh, and giving users more, more power than they normally would have. So um, I've actually, I've, I've been talking with some folks from OpenAI about trying to find a way um, to do that with, with something like Dolly 2. And I think the AI2 would be really well positioned to do this. Um, so from the lens of, of the Semantic Scholar product specifically, um, I think there's super interesting questions about what kind of decision-making power should be given to the people who make the content and use the search engine. Um, and uh, then maybe for large language models, there, there are similar questions about trying to give, give people who actually wrote the text or who played a role in curating the text by, say, upvoting on Reddit or um, liking things on Twitter, uh, giving them more say. And so this is an area I'm super excited at thinking about. And this is kind of more on the wild, unrealistic side. We'd love to hear what you think. Uh, so to end on a summarizing point, data leverage provides a new way of thinking about negative impacts of computing systems and working towards positive some futures. Uh, really quick, here is a bunch of people who helped me, of course, uh, you know, in the theme of the presentation, it's all a big, big collective effort. So lots of lots of organizations and, and institutions to thank and lots of individual people to thank. Um, very grateful for all of them. And with that, I would love to answer some more questions or, or uh, chat about whatever. Thank you so much. Let's thank the speaker. And we have plenty of time. Well, we have some time for questions. Um, yeah, does anyone have a question? I guess I can go. Um, and it, 
Uh, great talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, I guess uh, you briefly talked about like giving characteristics to the users. I was wondering, um, say if you have data to how these users are connected, say who they follow on Pinterest or their friends on Pinterest, um, how, how would you imagine approaching this data? And, and like, what are some potentially interesting analyses that we can do? Yeah, definitely. So this is something I'm, I'm super excited about, actually. Um, so in the data valuation space, there's all this work on the individual data valuation. I think that's, and I kind of raised some points about why that could be concerning or maybe could not be the best thing to use, especially if we're trying to try to pay people or give people credit. Um, but there are lots of ways to, to do kind of group data valuations to say, you know, here's random 30% of users are all the people in the data set who like specialty coffee or, or comedy movies. Um, you know, how much would, would, if that whole group comes together and pulls their data out or deletes it or modifies it, what impact would that have? Um, and so we can do that pretty easily with like random samples. And, and kind of that's what we did, you know, in our work on, on my uh, grad student academic budget. Um, but I think what would be really cool or the, the more interesting thing is actually what I would call like a, a propensity, not, not propensity score matching, but a, a, a propensity to collaborate um, weighted version of that, right? Where instead of doing random groups, we would basically try to figure out which groups are likely to actually collaborate in real life. Like what are the social networks? Who are the people that are actually gonna do a data strike together? And try to calculate those values. That, that's the most, if we're gonna do this simulation work and do this data valuation work, um, which is you know also quite popular just in the kind of like theoretical and, and empirical ML space. Um, I think doing it weighted in some manner to take into account real world social networks uh, would be like the most, most exciting way to do it. Um, so that's one direction. Uh, also, that info would be really useful for trying to organize uh, collective action as well. But that's kind of like a whole other can of worms to it, and also opens some some ethical dimensions about um, you know if we should be using data to to do that versus letting people kind of organize on their own. Thanks. Uh, I have one quick question. Um, if we can sneak it in in time. Um, yeah. Uh, I think uh, one of the one of the things that I was wondering throughout your talk was um, a lot of what you presented was around, I guess, informing or or empowering um, the, the, the 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 users to, to to be able to exact some leverage on the companies. But I'm wondering if there are if you have thoughts on in how to incentivize companies to sort of uh, provide that power uh, to the to the users because um, like why would they want to do that at all? Yes, yeah, hundred percent. So I think that the I have a couple arguments on this. So one answer to this is like, oh, don't do it at all. Um, just you know, do make try to advocate for the government to pass laws and force the companies to do it. And I, I'm not like personally like so I think some people would have that view. It's not my my personal view. Um, I think the most convincing argument is almost uh, sort of a corporate social responsibility argument, which is that you don't want, from like a PR perspective and from a moral perspective. Um, you don't want your firm to be running in the long term. I believe you don't want your firm to be running AI technologies that are like broadly doing things that people don't like. And so opening up these options, it, it's kind of like a way of collecting feedback, right? Like an alternative is you could hire a hundred, um, you know, UXRs or like survey experts and tell them, Hey, go out, you know, conduct a random survey of all the people who use our platform and, you know, prompt them with a bunch of notifications and do interviews with them and figure out what they want us to do. Um, but I would actually say that just opening up the new forms of agency uh, can achieve the same thing, actually, in, in an easier fashion. Um, well, I mean, if it's easier or not, that comes down to a particular cost-benefit analysis. But uh, basically, the short answer is it's kind of a corporate social responsibility approach, I think, which, uh, which has its downsides, but also, I think, can, can totally be effective. Awesome. Thanks. It uh, looks like I saw some people hopping out because it's at 2. So yep. let's the speaker one more time. Um, thanks again for a great talk, Nick. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone.